Okay. I, I see how far I get. So still at the moment I stay with mechanics. Though just to illustrate why this is important, and uh, I have to go against movies, which I only can do in this way. So this is when you have a real polymer. Yeah, you have entanglements, and you can stretch. That actually sometimes is annoying when you eat spaghetti. Yeah, and what you see is. While you stretch, you actually get some orientation. And just to repeat it once more, why we like polymers, the key is all these entanglements, these physical cross-links that hold the material together. Like Flory said, it's this which makes polymer different. No other material, metals or ceramics have that. The problem is, often in our world, we have this, they're not really macaronis, but very short spaghetti, I don't know how you would call them in Italy. Yeah? Here you have zero interconnectivity. So mechanically, they're really, really not good. Okay. However, you also can imagine that all these things here electronically, these end groups, really will be disastrous for electronics. So that's why we really have to care about molecular weight. So it's not only the microstructure, but already how they form in solution or the melt. And there's actually simply two principal trends how properties can change with molecular length. So first we have a property that essentially goes at the beginning linear with this lambular crystal thickness. So it proves and proves once you have entanglement uh, it decreases again, so that's when we have the molecular weight between entanglement. Why does it increase? Because actually these lamellar crystal thickness, the thickness of the crystals decreases again. So this is true for melting temperature, a key. We often use that in my lab to figure out when we compare samples about the lamellar crystal thickness. And that's not the crystal size you measure in the x-ray, for instance. Uh, in X-ray, what you measure from the peak width is actually the X-Y dimension. So it's this one and the one uh, going into the, the screen. What is relevant for the melting temperature is really this, the set direction. And this is also, you see, relevant for electronics because crystallinity, which we often attribute or correlate with the charge tra uh, transport properties, exactly follows this trend too. The other one is that depends on interconnectivity, these entanglements. So they are actually very bad, as the little movie on the stretching of the small molecular weight spaghetti showed. Once you have entanglements, these properties actually massively increase very fast and level off. So that's true for strength, toughness, but I also will show you, for instance, field effect mobility as measured in a transistor will follow this trend. And it saturates once you have four times Me, so our molecular weight, four times the molecular weight between entanglement, meaning you have three entanglements per chain. So just an example, if you want to have a look at your own polymers, where does this transition occur? As I showed already, Martha Breckmann did it with TM. Admittedly, here you already have to know what you're looking for and you have to be a very, very good transition electron microscopist. There are not many around, so I trust Marta. There's the NIST people, though many people just burn their polymers in the microscope. However, well, as I said before, here you really see the amorphous part, the crystalline parts. In AFM, and I'm really not a big fan for using AFM, atomic force microscopy, to look into crystals, or crystallinity, what you see though, it just gives a very undescriptive surface. This is different when you have these small molecular weights, where actually you see in AFM these chain extended crystals, these which form these fibrils. So in this sense, you maybe can use AFM simply to figure out do we form fibrils, then you can sort of hope or assume that you didn't have much entanglements once you get more disrupt microstructure, it possibly has been a real polymer. 
We actually in our group refer to thermal analysis. Who knows about DSC? That's good. It's a very, very simple method, uh, which we use a lot to deduce a whole range of information. In thermal, ana uh, thermal analysis, so differential scanning calorimetry, what you do is measuring uh, phase transitions. So in this case, we measure the melting. And we did that for P3HTs of various molecular weights. And then you see, depending on the molecular weight, as expected, first the melting increases and then decreases uh, because here we assume the, gen uh, the crystal thickness increases, then decreases. So question for you, why do we have here two melting points? Maybe I give two options. So A, it's polydisperse. So we have materials of different chain lengths. Two, we have a material that doesn't know what it wants to be, a chain extended crystal or a semi-crystalline microstructure. So who is for A? Who is for B? It is B. It could be both. Like this material is a polydisperse. Here, we really know that it's monodisperse. So here you have two melting points because the higher melting point comes from crystals that were uh, molecules that were not entangled. So they form a chain extended crystal. So they are longer, they are thicker, the crystals, leading to this high melting temperature. But there were also some molecules that were long enough to entangle. So they folded up getting smaller, less thick crystals, and therefore the melting was lower. But it's a clear trend. And this is confirmed when we now cool the samples. So we have molten all the samples, cool down, and what you see here, the small molecular weight materials crystallize earlier. That means when they crystallize earlier, they crystallize easier. So a high crystallization temperature means they are kinetically less hindered. As soon as you go to longer chains, you see that the molecules start to have trouble to crystallize because of all these entanglements they have. And this transition again occurs in this molecular weight regime between 20 and 30 kilogram per mole. So with these very simple experiments, you need possibly three milligrams per sample. You immediately can figure out uh, where this transition occurs. And we can go further, something we often do with thermal analysis, we take what is called the enthalpy of fusion. So when you take the area underneath the melting temperature. So this enthalpy gives you how much energy you have to put in into a material to melt it. And the more crystalline the material is, the more energy you have to put in there. And therefore you see the trend for the different molecular weights. At very low molecular weights, you see the effect of the end groups. So the end groups really dominate, and therefore the material compact very well. So the enthalpy fusion is low, meaning this material is of a low crystalline order. Similar for the polymers, they have so many entanglements in there that they also have different uh, difficulties to order. Again, low enthalpy of fusion. And here you just have a compromise. So they're just long enough that end groups don't really hinder them anymore, but they're just short enough not to entangle too much. So again, this graph is typical for any polymer in the world. And you see here, this peak indicates that here you have the highest degree of crystallinity, meaning there you just have maybe two, three entanglements per chain. One word of warning, uh, wide angle X-ray does not help you here. A lot of people use wide angle X-ray. I mean, you have to be a specialist, like the group of Alberto Sadeo, Michael Chevalik. But the only thing you can use from these X patterns, indeed, is well, we don't create the polymorphs, meaning we don't have different crystal structures. You get similar uh, diffraction peaks. You could argue, okay, this one is more intense, a bit more narrow, but it could also be an effect of film thickness, etc. So be very, very careful with using wide angle X ray to deduce anything. Indeed, when we use all our before information, uh, it would be very difficult to pinpoint the transition of extended to non extended uh, crystals simply based on X ray. 
tools like DSC is, are much, much, much more powerful. And now we come to tensile deformation. There was a question. They are a very good tool. Admittedly, with the amount of materials we usually have, not entirely simple, is tensile deformation. It's similar like viscosity. The mechanics, how much can I stretch a material before it breaks, depends on the amount of entanglements. When, when I don't have entanglements, it, you stretch it a tiny bit, so very small elongation, it breaks, nearly like a ceramic. So it's brittle. The reason being it's brittle, we don't have this uh, interconnectivity between crystals. Now, how do we know that we have three entanglements per chain at this specific molecular weight? If you see that here, we have a deviation from a linear behavior. The linear regime is called Hooke's law for any mechanic person. However, when we stretch this material further, we have this deviation. So this is called onset of plastic deformation. Meaning this little part, if you stretch the material, it doesn't break, it will stay in this deformed state. And because it's just tiny bit, you know, this is really the onset, so that's where we have three entanglements per chain. Admittedly, it's not fully quantitative, but it gives you a very good feeling where things occur, because also at the end, there are always some insecurities about the molecular weights, uh, how you measure the molecular weight. And if you go to very long molecular weights, so you have a lot of those entanglements, but between these entanglements you have a lot of uh, chain to stretch. So you see now we can really have a massive plastic deformation, and if you go even to high molecular weights, you see actually the material gets stronger while you stretch. So therefore here it deviates again. So here you strengthen the material, and the reason being is you orient the molecules while you stretch. So you start to more and more probe the carbon-carbon bonds. So you start, at least in one direction, to get much more diamond-like. So these materials, once you have the entanglement, are tough. So based on tensile deformation and thermal analysis, without really fancy other experiments, we know exactly we have a transition between non-entangled and entangled materials occurs. And then we now look at electronics at the end. We're here for uh, OPV conference or workshop. You see actually correlates strikingly when you have now field effect mobility. So you make a transistor with your semiconductor where the mobility essentially saturates. This was actually a graph that puzzled me for years. Because I would have assumed intuitively small molecular weight materials should crystallize better, should have better mobility. Here you really see end groups in small, mole well, sm small molecular weight macromolecules can be given for charge, trans charge transport, most likely because of grain boundaries. However, once you have these entanglements, you have interconnectivity, which seems to have charge transport. Another reason can also simply be these materials are really very much, much more forgiving with processing. You always will get a good film versus here not, which will affect the charge transport. There's a bit of salt in the whole theory when we do time of flight. So we have now here not an interface device, but a diode device. Two electrodes we shine light on, create charges, apply a voltage, measure the time. We see the opposite trend. So what this sort of implies is either time of flight is not so dependent on the film uh, forming, or that the bulk mobility much more depends on the degree of crystallinity. Because latest results here show that actually eventually the, the time of flight mobility drops. But it's still something that puzzles me. So we still have to look into why the bulk charge transport is not really that dependent on extended versus non-extended, and maybe more looks like um, a dependence on crystallinity. Though hopefully I could show you one key thing is, okay, you have to look at molecular conformation, molecular weight, but whatever we do, we really have to adjust the processing appropriately. So this was quite a bit on bulk polymers, especially the rest on uh, P3HD. 
I've showed a bit that P3HD, like charge transport, the transistors depends on molecular weight. Here we now more in OPVs. So let's look on uh, how, let's say, photogenerated charges depend on the molecular weight of material. And why did we start that? Let's actually work with Gary. The reason is really this microstructure development. We were curious how does the charge generation depend on these materials where we essentially have one phase. So we have crystals. These crystals are not necessarily of good quality, so we have to learn to uh, distinguish between bad crystalline order or good crystalline order as well as degree of crystallinity. Over here, here we have crystalline moieties as well as amorphous phases. And that this microstructure really strongly influences electronics, you see immediately already from very simple UVB spectra. And that was actually collaboration with Carla Silva at the University of Montreal. So when we did, or well actually that was Chandika together with Francis in Carlos' group, measured the UVB spectra of different molecular weights. So we had two materials which were chain extended, not entangled according to our measurements, and two materials which had quite high molecular weight, where we really know that we have, from the mechanical properties, really a lot of entanglements. You see that the absorption spectrum massively changes. Then we get maybe the blue shift for the small molecular weights. You could expect you have shorter chains, Obviously, the conjugation length will be shorter. You should see a blue shift in absorption spectra. However, what puzzled me for ages was this trend here of the zero zero absorption uh, peak. Because in literature, there was a lot about this zero zero transition being directly correlated with order. And as said, I always assumed at least this 14 uh, kilogram per mole material should be at the edge of being chain extended uh, to folding, so n groups should not really matter so much, so order should be quite good. And why should actually the highest molecular weight material, the polymer, have the highest order? And here comes again this uh, very fine distinct, uh, di distinction in place about degree of crystallinity and crystalline order. So based on these measurements, we finally assume at least here we have amorphous phases, but based on these crystals we have in, embedded in amorphous phases, it seems these crystalline moieties are actually better ordered. And they're not necessarily long range order. And when we now deduce, this has a massive effect on what is called the free exciton bandwidth, meaning in the material science peak, I'm sure Carlos would possibly disagree with me, the free exciton bandwidth gives you how much the exciton is localized or delocalized along the polymer chain. And what we see is, based on a paper I really can recommend by Frank Stano, what they do is taking the ratio between the 0, 0 and the 0, 1 absorption, they can calculate this. We see we have a large exciton uh, bandwidth for the small molecules. Once we have this transition to the entangled structure, the free exciton and then it drops. What does it mean? Here, the exciton is really localized on the chain. So it maybe it's delocalized perpendicular, but it doesn't really move. Why? I should draw these schematics differently. So I should really put in the, the end groups. In small molecular weight crystals, actually, often the, the chains are much more distorted. So it makes sense that, therefore, once you create an exciton, it can't move along the chains. On the other hand, here, what this low exciton uh, bandwidth means is if we want to create, I have to be careful, <laughs> once you create the exciton, actually can quite easily move along the chain. And what it means here is these crystal moieties in the polymer, uh, the chain is quite stretched out. And that makes sense because here on the interface, of the crystal to the amorphous phase, there's nothing which should lead to the distortion of the chain. So it's like a little stretch experiment. And indeed, in the back com commodity world, there was a lot of in investigation on this strained amorphous phase, meaning you have here an interface of a crystal, 
a strange amorphous phase, which is not fully amorphous, so the, the chains are somewhat oriented <coughs> to uh, the fully amorphous phase. So it gives you actually quite some information on the chain conformation. And we, we tested this hypothesis by using small oligomers with really large end groups like chromium. And we see when we have chromium on both sides, the chains are really, really twisted and then really affecting the free exciton bandwidth. So based on simple UV-Vis uh, measurements, we can get actually computational information. We also get information on the aggregates. And that's also something I don't fully understand. So it tells us we have more photophysical aggregates in the system. And what this also tells us is maybe photophysical aggregates, so they are active leading to a higher zero zero absorption, not necessarily mean, means more crystals. So it simply means you have possibly two chains where they're stretched out coming together. But something we still have to learn about. However, the free exciton bandwidth, I think it's very telling, and in particular, how drastic this changes from chain extended crystals to the semi crystalline morphology. And having the expert in the audience, I will not really uh, talk about photo microwave conductivity, how it works. Uh, Nikos, I guess, gave a very nice introduction. However, we also check now how does the molecular wave influence the microwave conductivity response. So, already when we tested two extremes, so very low molecular weight versus a very high molecular weight, and looked at how the material, when you excite it, so we shine a laser pulse and measure how, much, how long this photo conductance stays, you see when we have a high molecular weight, the response is essentially not dependent on intensity. So it means we must have some dark carriers in there. However, for the small molecular weights, we see that the higher intense our laser is, the faster actually the material decays. So clearly, despite we have the same chemistry, just having different microstructures, we have different decay orders, a second order for the low molecular weight and a first order decay for the high molecular weight. Why should it be? It's exactly the same chemistry. So clearly the microstructure must have a massive influence on this behavior. Can we now look also here at the photoconductance, so the, the product of the charge generation yield versus the end, the sum, of the mobility, we, we can actually get an estimate of the photogenerated charges, assuming, and Gary has shown them many times, that the mobility for the different systems doesn't change. So when we now plot this photoconductance for the different molecular weights, you see again a very nice trend that more charges are created, the larger the molecular weight of the material. So again, the same material, the only thing we change is the length. And when we plot now the, the charge generation yield, because we assume the mobility is the same, what is striking is you see a linear dependence where we know that we, or think at least we know, that we don't have entanglements. Once, very similar to the charge carrying mobility in OFETs, we have this entanglement, we get to this uh, two phase semi crystalline structure, the charge generation yield stays the same. So polymers, again, seem better performing in this sense. So why is that? So now I have a bit of a better schematic of the small molecular weight materials. So these form these chain extended crystals. However, as I said, the molecular order within these crystals seems not to be very good, as already also uh, supported by our UVBIS experiments. The reason being, these end groups really start to distort the chains. And if you have actually polydispersity, there was a discussion on polydispersity during one of the project uh, meetings. Here, polydispersity, in my opinion, is killing because the small molecules maybe can get into the crystals, but really will distort the crystal. However, here, polydispersity most likely will not really be effectful because what will happen is 
small molecules will just go into the amorphous phase or will be pushed into the amorphous phase. The question though now is, why does this microstructure have such a different behavior both in UV-VIS as well as in the microwave of photoconductivity measurements? Is it because we actually, uh, the, the pairs we create are trapped in, uh, here in the grain boundaries? Is it here we have a high yield because somehow these charges can like run around between the crystals in the morphous space in the next crystal because one macromolecule goes through the different crystals? Or does it have to do because here we have a two-phase system, so we have one compound, P3HT, but we have two phases, uh, the crystalline P3HT phase, the morphous P3HT phase, versus here we only have one crystalline phase, despite the order of the crystalline phase is not that good. So we wanted to look into this difference and really figuring out what is the microstructural origin of this difference. And now here, processing comes uh, into play, and that's actually what I like to do. So what we took is a material, actually two materials, both of them having entanglements. So we have this 50 kilogram per mole, which we believe has two, three entanglements, and one of high molecular weight, where we really know has many entanglements. And it looks nearly as simple, it is nearly as simple as it looks. We simply want to take this material and make chain extended crystals with it. How can we do that? Very simple. Uh, Carlos, um, my collaborator at the University of Montreal, actually is Mexican. We actually used once a tortilla press, it works. Yeah? So it's that simple, nothing fancy. What it happens is you simply take the powder, and actually Esther is the expert, so in case you need hints, <laughs> she, will, she will tell you all the secrets. It's not so many secrets involved. It's really, you take a hot press, sometimes we heat so that the three press doesn't really work. Uh, put the powder in between, press. This, this is actually not very high pressure. Actually, the less pressure you apply, the better. So it's like creep. Uh, we have seen some snow on Saturday. It's really like a process. I come from the Swiss mountains, a glacier. Usually the glaciers, glaciers actually, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the glaciers, they're used to move and get longer. The reason being is there's a bit of pressure by its own weight and therefore it's what is called creep. So it slowly elevates over time. Here we do exactly the same. We apply a bit of pressure, maybe a bit of temperature and we have elongation over time. If you apply too much pressure, actually, you will not get a film, you break it up. You really need this molecular movement in the solid state. So that the, the, the slowly you apply the pressure, the more time you give it, without actually degrading your material, because often if you do heat a bit, the better, and the more the material can stretch out. Nothing new, actually, it has been done uh, with polyethylene, and how can you figure out that you successfully went from this one to this one. And you guess, how would you measure uh, if you did chain extend the crystals? So let's get at least three options. X-ray, thermal analysis, light scattering. So who is for X-ray? Thermal analysis, light scattering, Definitely thermal analysis. To be honest, I think light scattering would do the job too, but it's massively more complicated. <laughs> so we did uh, thermal analysis. X-ray will not show that, at least wide angle X-ray. You have to go to small angle X-ray, which is really a pain with small uh, with polymers. So we opted for the easiest, which is thermal analysis, and that has been described already again. 70s, 60s, whenever you need an answer to a problem about polymer science, go to the old literature. Most likely somebody has done it, and most likely with polyethylene, actually. So uh, this paper simply shows, for instance, what happens when they slowly crystallize. Actually, they use polyethylene oxide. Uh, material which was just at the edge of being entangled or not. And if they cooled it slowly, they got chain extended crystals. So this is a thermal ana analysis scan. 
So here you see this double peak. So this is the chainix, the melting of the chainix, then the crystals. Here is the melting of the folded crystals. And the faster they actually crystallize the material, you see kinetics wins, and therefore actually the folding wins. But it's very, very uh, established that this melting temperature, you immediately can get direct information on the crystal thickness. So we did that too. That sounds sharp here. So here we have our solid state pressed material. We heat it up, we melt it. So very high melting temperature. If we now cool down and we melt it, we get a melting temperature that you see is, uh, if you look here, 10 to 15 degree lower than the melted solution process material. So clearly, we did extend the material via solid state uh, pressing. What you also see is not that clear when you look at the enthalpy, so we take the area underneath the melting, we did that this area is actually larger than these two. So it also means we change the degree of crystallinity. You need to put in more energy to melt the material, so we also increased the orders. We did two things, we chain extended, and it's possibly not surprising because we chain extended the, the molecules could pack better and the degree of crystallinity changed. And we then therefore went back to Gary, Nikos, and Obadaya and measured these two materials, so our nearly like entangled, like three entanglements, high entanglement, we pressed. And actually, as we expected, it's rare that you actually get a result that you expect. Usually, I'm always a bit skeptical uh, when we get a result here. Uh, would like to have what happened when we produced these interfaces, we got much, much less yield. And I actually gave the story already away. Why did I expect that? So clearly, interconnectivity doesn't play a role. Because I have to say here, this material is still tough. So meaning if you stretch, you still can plastically deform it. This tells us that this material is long enough that even in the more extended crystals, you have one molecule going into a crystal, there still must be an amorphous phase uh, and getting into the other crystal. Just there's not much amorphous phase left. So clearly, the connectivity is not really an issue why the charge generation yield goes or go, is high in these materials. So what is it? Well, clearly, it has to do not with this interconnectivity or actually the grain boundaries, because here we, we, we have grain boundaries, but definitely this material will have some molecules going through the others. But our hypothesis, therefore, really was it has to do that we have a two-phase system. We have here the amorphous phase and the crystals. When we chain extend these materials, we get much, much less of this amorphous phase. So we reduce. We, we go from a two-phase system to a one-phase system. So we believe, or we started to believe, that these interfaces are really, really important. And therefore, actually, PFHG always is called an oddball. Not many other conjugate polymers, in my opinion, have this microstructure. There are a few polymers with sufficiently high molecular weights, like PPV. So, but PPVs usually are relatively unordered, so they don't have this crystalline phase, so you have one material, one phase. A lot of the new donor acceptor materials, they're just in this regime, so again, you have one material, you have one phase. Nonetheless, we like to test our hypothesis, especially when you get what you expect. So what we did is now here the opposite. So before we reduced the amount of interfaces, so we chain extended the chains, the molecules. Now we decided, okay, why don't we take these crystals and make the crystals smaller? And in this sense, not now the thickness, but this time the x, y direction. And how can we do that? It's called nucleation, big business in bulk commodity world. Tupperware, I mentioned Tupperware. They used to be white. I don't know if you're still, yeah, if you're old enough. They were white and brittle. Nowadays, a lot of the Tupperware is transparent because people want to see what is in the boxes. Why are they transparent? Because companies uh, put these little compounds in there. They're called nucleation agents. 
very small quantities, 0 0.1, 0.01 wave percent. But what these materials do, and I think it's actually in the next picture, polypropylene is nowadays used in Tupperware. They used to have large grid, uh, crystals, that's how I brittle this time, they broke here. You add a bit of this little mutation agent in, and these crystals get smaller. Because the crystals get smaller, they get actually deformed, they don't get to light anymore. Very well established. We did it with P3DTT, actually just heard, so it's just a bigger brother of P3HT. So here you have a dodecyl side chain, here you have C6. You add these classical nucleation agents in there, and then you want to see did we really nucleate the material? Contrary to polypropylene, unfortunately we couldn't do optical microscopy because P3HD crystals are already small or actually not very, very well developed, so very difficult to see. So again, we had to do thermal analysis. So we took this material, put a bit of this nucleation agent in, heated, and then just to be fair, here I used the nucleation agent for uh, milliken, here a nucleation for tzeva, so none of the companies can be uh, angry with us. So we heated, so when we have the neat material, the material really has trouble to crystallize, so meaning we have really to cool quite a bit till the material uh, forms crystals. However, when you add only one weight percent of this uh, nucleation agent, you see the onset of crystallization. So this peak tells us the material can crystallize much, much earlier. So higher crystallization temperature means it's easier to crystallize. So this tells us we really nucleated the material. And the same goes for solutions. So when you take P3HD, I guess it was in xylene, cool down, it usually crystallizes around room temperature. Once we add the nucleation agent, it crystallizes earlier. So full indication that we got smaller crystals. Now we went to Obadiah and did microwave conductivity measurements. So here's the need, actually P3DTT, and then the nucleated material and we saw that the photoconductance went up. I have to say we had a bit of trouble with reproducibility here. And I believe the problem is with our nucleation agents we used. We used materials which are made for polypropylene. Polypropylene has a very low solubility, so the nucleation agents really need to be even less soluble. The whole trick of a nucleation agent is that it precipitates before your polymer. So in our case, that was a bit of a pain because it, the nucleation agent was much less soluble than the p 3 dtt so small variations led to having no nucleation or not much in there. But well, so here it's actually the spread. So whenever we didn't have nucleation agents, we consistently, or actually we, that's Obadiah, measured uh, microwave uh, photoconductance of this value. When we add a nucleation agent, we always saw a higher one, but there was a spread. So the processing here is definitely a key. Now I think we learned from it. So when we have a two-phase system and uh, get to a one-phase system, so there are two options. We can actually simply use small molecular weight materials or we can actually dilute the system so we don't have entanglements, so we get chain extended crystals, or we can actually solid state press. What happens is uh, our charge generation yield goes down. That possibly tells chemists not to synthesize, oh, I see the time, <laughs> yeah. uh, a small molecular weight versus when we nucleate the material so we get more and more crystals, then the charge generation yield goes up. So clearly with the same material we can get completely different response and that's what I meant with processing. Really be very, very careful when you do process it, small variations will change this into play, essentially like dilution. And I think with this graph I will stop. That's simply a hypothesis forwarded by Gary. So why do we need these interfaces? So when we create the exciton here in the crystal, so that's my explanation of a Gary hypothesis, uh, that the exciton maybe can split. However, here also the mobility is quite high, so the charges will find each other quite fast. If we create an exciton and we can dissociate the charges, 
Well, it's an amorphous area, so the charges are anyway localized, and they will immediately recombine. However, here, we need this interface because we believe, actually, uh, we have different energy levels. It's like what Kuhn showed before. When you crystallize material, actually, you change some of the energy states. So if we create here now, uh, we dissociate the, the exciton, we believe that that's coming up tomorrow, a uh, driving force for the hole to go into the crystal because the crystal will have different energy levels than amorphous phase. So you can really split the, the exciton, the charges you separate, and there's a, not a big driving force for them to recombine. And actually with that, I know we have to stop for this part of my talking. Here's the questions. I mean, there's going to be a bit of time. Time for a few questions. Um, I just had a quick question about the so in, in the mechanical experiment, the mechanics experiments with dense house stress. How exactly are these experiments done? Like when you're doing elongation versus the stress, is it the same sort of the mechanism? Of how do you do that? Well, uh, what you do is usually you you cast a film, mm -hmm. and well it. it there's equipment, but you could even do it by hand, actually. You simply need two clamps, and you stretch and record at what length the material breaks. And obviously, you have to do it. You have to use the same sample shape for, for the different molecular weights. So the sample shape will influence where it breaks. So these type of uh, parameters, you have to keep the same. But at the end, it's really taking a material and stretch and measure when it breaks, essentially. Uh, I was wondering, in the crystalline, crystalline regions, how can we see the direction of these crystalline lamellars? Or how can we say how many percent of these crystallites have the same direction? Because that really affects the mechanical property as well. Uh, well, in our tests, we assume that we start with an isotropic film, and we see that and that's simply the reason how we prepared the films. Uh, we try to avoid uh, pre-orientation because like you said, this will affect the, the curve. And why we see that we did have quite an isotropic behavior is this large molecular weight. In case we had pre-orientation, actually even this high molecular weight would be very brittle because you had already oriented all of the chains so there's not much you can gain plasticity. So if you have a highly oriented, high molecular weight material, it would be very strong. So it would be like the red one, but very, very strong. But it would fail at very small elongations. So the fact that we really can strain the material, and we see this, what is called strain hardening, meaning the material gets stronger, uh, tells us we had a relatively isotropic uh, orientation of all the crystals at the beginning. And this uh, orientation, does it affect the electrical property? That was a simple question like before. I mean, people tried to make transistors with oriented polymers. Sometimes it's very difficult to... They found anisotropies, sometimes of 10, 100 times, actually including me. <laughs> However, often you had to do something to orient the material, so you had to have an alignment layer. So sometimes the, the anisotropy you saw, I don't believe, came from the orientation, but because you had in one direction of the film more inhomogeneities in there, because you used alignment layer or things like that. And if you look at recent single crystal work, I think the anisotropy eventually is not that large. So I think other aspects uh, are much more dominant. Thank you. Thank you. Cut the questions at that point. Uh, the time is up. So let's thank Ali for joining us.